Well, praise the Lord, everyone, and welcome to our Sunday morning Sanctuary Bible class here at New Life Austin. So glad that you could join us and trust that you have had a good 4th of July weekend and um, those that perhaps have gotten a long weekend out of the deal that you have made good use of that in spite of all of the limitations that are in place. Trust that everyone is uh, staying safe and we are looking forward, of course, to the time where we can be back together again. But until that time, we're going to take advantage of the opportunities that technology provides us. And we're so grateful that you have chosen to spend a little time with us today. And uh, we're going to spend some time uh, this morning in the Word of the Lord. We'll be continuing in John chapter 10. Hopefully, wrapping up our time here, we have spent several weeks in John chapter 10. But as we get started this morning, I'd like for us to just go to the Lord in prayer, invite His presence into the room wherever you are, and that our minds would be drawn to focus on the Lord and upon His words, and that He would open our hearts and minds to receive what He has for us today. And just trusting that the Lord is going to bless not only our time together, but uh, our worship services that you'll be able to join following this lesson and uh, archived uh, later if you have if you miss or if things are out of order they always are archived and you can go back trust that the Lord will meet with you in that time of worship and let's just invite his presence in today Lord we're so thankful for the opportunity that we have to gather even together virtually together we're trusting that you Lord we know that you are not limited by the things that seem like limitations to us, and so we're trusting that you will work in all of our hearts and that you will open our hearts and minds to receive your word and that your will will be accomplished. Make us sensitive. Help us, Lord. Lead us and guide us. Help us to be sensitive to your spirit and to follow after you, and we're trusting that you will continue to work in our hearts, in our lives, that you will protect and you will preserve us and you will bring us together. And until that time that your spirit will work exceedingly among us and that you will be with us, Lord, we're trusting we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, as I said, we will be continuing in John chapter 10 this morning, and we've been here for a few weeks now, but I think it is appropriate to spend some time here, and we've spent the last several weeks on this kind of closing Portion or maybe the latter half of the chapter. And uh, there is much that is rich in this chapter that we've been trying to, to mine out and to uh, bring value and uh, hopefully understand maybe some of the subtleties involved in this conversation back and forth. But I do think this is a crucial juncture, as we have mentioned multiple times. This seems to be the occasion of the Lord's last real striving or uh, invitation to the Jewish leadership. It seems to be falling on deaf ears, of course. uh, Their unbelief, the die has been cast, and it seems that nothing that he says will shake them or jar them from their unbelief. But uh, he continues to uh, speak to them and even to become plain, even more plain than he had been, in the past, and uh, we talked about some of that last week in John chapter 10, verse 30. I and my Father are one. And uh, of course, they took up stones then because they saw that he was making himself identical with God. And as we related, it's not just that he was claiming some of the attributes or that the Lord or that God had given to him some temporary authority to do certain things. But he was claiming to be identically the same as God. And of course, as we know from later writings, uh, this doctrine is fleshed out and, and it becomes clear not only from the writings of John. John had a clear understanding writing this book much later than the other Gospels and re- relaying the events that he chose to relay. He had a very clear understanding that Jesus was fully human, but he was also fully divine. He was the express image of God in the flesh. That's language that was used by the writer in the opening part of the book of Hebrews. 
And, uh, of course, John lays this doctrine out. Other New Testament writers have laid out this doctrine. It was very plain to those Jewish leaders what Jesus was saying. And uh, he was claiming this equality and this identity with God. And that was more than they could conceive of. And what we're going to see today is that Jesus makes what is for us being separated 2,000 years from this occurrence. This is a bit of a difficult argument that Jesus makes uh, that we're going to look at this morning. And uh, I, I want to try to, to try to help us to understand what Jesus was saying and hopefully to allay any uh, fears and, and clear up any confusion maybe that you find in reading these verses because uh, they can be a bit troubling. But as we were talking last week, the real struggle for these Jewish leaders was that Jesus was claiming to be something that they found inconceivable. It was beyond what they were willing to accept. And you might even argue it was beyond what they were able to conceive of. They, were, they could not understand, they could not, uh, I guess the phrase these days, they could not wrap their mind around what Jesus was saying because here he stood in front of them and they clearly understood no man has seen God at any time. This was part of their, uh, their understanding. And if you read Isaiah chapter 6, they, um, this is the image of God that was dominant, I think, among um, those that were so versed in the Old Testament. Uh, Isaiah said he saw the Lord high and lifted up and his train filled the temple. It's this very majestic vision of God. And, and uh, you get the, the feeling that Isaiah could not even look upon God. He was describing um, something that was almost indescribable. And, and uh, this was, of course, the Jewish view of God, that he would be uh, unapproachable in that way. Um, and this goes all the way back to, to Moses, where he, um, he asked the Lord, he said, show me your glory. And the Lord said, no man can see me and live. But he said, I will put you in a cleft in the rock, and I will cover you, and I'll I'll allow you to get a glimpse and uh, just see just a part of me and a, just a part of my glory. And, and all of this fed into uh, this Jewish idea, and really I guess we probably still hold it today. There should be a sense of awe at the presence of God and, and uh, even, a, even a fear uh, of what uh, it might be like to be in the presence of God. This is... This is borne out by Scripture. Every time there was a, an encounter with the angel of the Lord, um, or any time anyone had a vision, if you read uh, the other of John's writings toward the end of our New Testament, the, the book of the Revelation, you see that when the Lord Jesus appeared to John again, that he said he fell down as dead. And that's a very common response and a very common reaction anytime one is in the presence of even an angel of the Lord, much less the Lord, there was always a response of, of fear. And, and uh, it seemed like the first words out of every angel on every angelic visitation was, fear not, don't be afraid, because there is something so awesome about that presence of God. And that certainly is true. It was held by the Jewish leaders and and for this man, Christ Jesus, to stand in front of them and to say, I and my Father are one, to make himself equal with God was just inconceivable. How could that great and that awesome God, and I don't use the word awesome like um, it gets commonly used these days, but, but I'm trying to rake up every bit of meaning and connotation from the historical use of the word awesome. That is uh, one that would... Uh, that we would be in awe of, and the greatness and the size, and, and everything about his presence would be larger than life. And it's just beyond the concepts of these leaders that this man would be God in the flesh, that he would be the human expression of the great God. And yet, that's what he was claiming to be. And so... Um, 
When they took up the stones, Jesus, of course, answered them as we have discussed. And he said, uh, many good works have I showed you from my father. For which of these works do you stone me? The Jews answered him saying, verse 33, for a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. Now, this is the point at which Jesus takes up this, what I would consider to be a very difficult argument. So let's read a few verses. Jesus answered them, verse 34, Is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent unto the, into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said, I am the Son of God? If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though you believe not me, believe the works, that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. So the last part of this discussion, Jesus is saying, even if you don't believe what I'm telling you, you should believe for the very work's sake because I'm doing the works of my Father. You have said... You have said that I have a devil or that I am a Samaritan. And you have, you have put on me that, that I have a devil. That is, you are giving credit to Satan for the works that I do. But what good works has Satan ever done for you? Has, you know, this is what is bound up in what Jesus is saying. Has Satan ever healed your blind? Has Satan ever delivered people from demonic possession, as Jesus had done? Had, has Satan ever healed? Has Satan ever raised anyone from the dead? So he's saying, look, it's clear, I'm doing works that only God could do. And I'm doing works that only God would do. So if you don't believe my arguments, if you don't believe my statements, at least believe my works. But before he makes that argument, he makes another argument to say, why is what I am telling you so inconceivable? And uh, this argument is, um, I, I don't know, I mean, I, I guess we should not be shocked that Jesus would um, be a really smart guy and that he would reach back into the Old Testament and pull out what many would consider to be obscure passage of Scripture and I'm sure that these leaders were familiar with it, but he is referring in verse 34, he's referring, referring to Psalm 82. Jesus answered, Is it not written in your law, I said, ye are gods? If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said I am the Son of God? So Jesus is saying, look, I, I'm not breaking, I'm not really uh, exploring new territory here because it's even written in the law that you're gods. Now this causes all kinds of concerns immediately when we just read this. Uh, wait a minute, what is Jesus saying? Are we, all, um, are we all identical with God? Are we all gods? Are we just little gods walking around on the earth? And there are theologies, I suppose, that are out there to that end. Uh, but I don't think that's what Jesus is saying at all. And perhaps it's helpful if we go back to Psalm 82 and just uh, do a little bit of, um, I, I don't know, maybe a little uh, exegesis in Psalm 82 real quick to kind, of get the, um, to kind of get the context and understand what Jesus is saying. So let's look at Psalm 82. If you have your Bible, you might want to turn there. And I'll just read. Um, let me just read it through. It's eight verses long. And then we'll talk about a few key points here in the middle of it. So Psalm 82, the word of the Lord says, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. And then he asks, how long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Selah. Defend the poor and fatherless. Do justice to the afflicted and needy. Deliver the poor and needy. Rid them out of the hand of the wicked. 
They know not, neither will they understand. They walk on in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are out of course. I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. But ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for thou shalt inherit all nations. So, I guess one interesting point is that Jesus would say, first of all, is this not written in your law? And you notice this passage is not coming from one of the first five books of the Bible, but it's coming out of the Psalms. So if there's ever any question about what Jesus thought about the Old Testament, specifically about the Psalms, you can see here that he's referring to this Psalm as being part of the law, that is part of the revealed Word of God to, these, uh, to the world, to Israel first and to the world by extension. And so uh, let's just look at this very quickly, the first verse, God standeth in the congregation of the mighty. He judgeth among the gods. Well, who is he talking about? He judges among the gods. Well, he reveals in verse 2 who he's talking about. How long will you judge unjustly and accept the persons of the wicked? Well, who is it that judges and accepts the wicked and accepts um, the unrighteous? He's talking, it's not... It's not that he's judging in the spirit world. He is talking about the judges of Israel. Now, what we need to understand is this word that is translated gods here is the word Elohim. So it is not Yahweh, Jehovah. It's not the one true God. But it is the Hebrew word that very often is translated gods. But it can have other shades of meaning. Sometimes the angels are referred to as Elohim. That is a plural noun. Um, so the angels are sometimes referred to as Elohim. And there are occasions in Scripture, if you go back and read in the book of Judges, there are several occasions where it is very clear that the human judges of Israel are referred to as Elohim. And this is what the Lord is referencing here in Psalm 82. He's asking those corrupt judges, how long will you judge unjustly? And then he, in verses 3, 4, and 5, he gives them a set of directions. And he tells them that they are corrupt, but the way to correct their corruption is to defend the fatherless and the poor, do justice to the afflicted and needy, Deliver the poor and needy, rid them out of the hand of the wicked, save those who are powerless, save those who cannot defend themselves. You are men of power and authority. You are judges. You have authority in Israel. And you are uh, to use that power and authority, not to enrich yourself, but to defend those who cannot defend themselves. In verse 6, he says, I have said, ye are gods, and all of you are children of the Most High. But ye shall die like men, verse 7, and fall like one of the princes. Seems like he's saying, you think you're invincible because you have this position, and uh, you are a judge in Israel, and uh, no one has authority to go over you. And so you have a very protected place, and so there is an aura uh, sense of invincibility about you. But the Lord says, don't be deceived. Uh, even though I have said you're gods, you're going to just die like normal men. You, your position does not protect you from the way of humanity and the way of men. So it's very clear here he's talking to the judges of Israel and uh, addressing their corruption. And even though the word Elohim is used there, Again, it could be used of angels. It could be used of, um, and it is used in Scripture in reference to these judges. And it seems like, especially when you pair this with what Jesus says in John chapter 10, that the reason why they are called Elohim or lowercase gods, their function and their duty was to serve as a representative of God. So what the Lord is telling them here is, your, your purpose is to help to work out my will on the earth. But because of your corruption, you're using that to enrich yourself. But you, again, should be defending 
the poor and the needy and those that are powerless. And you are the representative of God. And um, so going back then to John chapter 10, Jesus says, If he called them gods unto whom the word of God came, verse 35, and the scripture cannot be broken, why say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent in the world, thou blasphemest, because I said I am the Son of God. So what Jesus is saying here is really emphasizing this aspect of them, being these judges, being looked on as little gods or as men with great authority and great responsibility. The reason why they were the representatives of the Most High God was because they were the ones that had been entrusted with the Word of God. And this is a key point. Jesus makes the case that they were called gods because unto them was trusted the Word of God. Now, remember, it was different in their day than in our day. We have the Word of God printed for us, and it's very accessible to us. The vast majority of our population can um, access the Word of the Lord either through reading or through listening that is available uh, via technology on the internet, we have great access to the Word of the Lord. But literacy and, of course, technology was very different in those days, and it was to those people in great authority that the Word of God had been given. They would be among the relative few in society who could read and write. And so the Word of God was trusted to them, and they were entrusted with this Word. And this is what Jesus was saying. They were entrusted with the word and they were entrusted with the injunction then to fulfill the word and to bring, um, to judge rightly so that truth and justice would rule and reign in, the, in uh, their society. And Psalm 82 was addressing them because they were unjust and corrupt. Now what Jesus does is he pulls out that psalm and he says to these Jews who are trying to stone him for blasphemy, essentially what he's saying is, I said I was the son of God. And that's beyond the pale for you. That is beyond what you're able to conceive. But why is that so hard to conceive? Since even in your own law, unjust, corrupt judges were called gods because they had received the word of God. Their authority came from the fact that they had received the Word of God. Now, some in reading this have thought that Jesus was trying to excuse himself on a technicality. To say, well, I, I didn't really say I was equal with God. I'm saying I'm like a judge or a rabbi. I'm like a teacher who has received the Word of God. I am a, I'm saying that I'm God in the same sense is used in Psalm 82. But that's not what he's doing at all. He's, he's not downplaying his role. What he's doing is he's arguing from the lesser to the greater. He's saying, you're having trouble accepting what I'm telling you, that I am God manifest in the flesh. Not in those words, but that's what he meant. It's very clear that's what he meant. And they had trouble accepting that. And Jesus is asking them, why is this so hard for you to believe when even in your own law, it is written that these corrupt judges, because they had received the word of God, they were called gods or judges or rulers or uh, this word Elohim. They were called gods in a manner of speaking. And what he leaves unspoken here is to say, I am even greater than that because it is not that I have received the word of God, but I am the word of God. Remember John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him. Without Him was not anything made that was made. And you skip down to verse 14, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glories of the only begotten of the Father. He's talking about Jesus Christ. What is that word in those first three verses of John chapter 1? That is the plan of God. It is in His mind. It is this idea and plan that was 
equal and identical with God from the very beginning. And Jesus was the full expression of that. Jesus was God manifest in the flesh. The Word became flesh. He was the Word there in John 1.14, as many have noted, really means He was tabernacled. So He was the Word of God that was robed, if you will, in flesh and dwelling among us. And we beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father. There is no doubt who is being discussed here. It is the man, Christ Jesus. He was that Word made flesh. What Jesus is saying is, if those corrupt rulers in the Old Testament that received the Word were thought of as little gods with great authority, why does it stretch you so much to believe that I am God in flesh? Because I haven't received the Word, but I am the Word. I am the manna that has come down from heaven. You'll remember, I am the bread of life. Think about all of the I am's that, that Jesus put to himself. And there is that one bread of life. I am the bread that's come down from heaven. And Jesus is saying, if arguing from the lesser to the greater, if you could somehow accept Psalm 82, then why can you not accept that God's Word is fully expressed and manifest and walking among you and be willing to give even greater appraisal and even greater understanding to the one who stands before you. The writer of the book of Hebrews makes it very clear in the opening verses of Hebrews where he says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past, unto the fathers by the prophets. So God spoke unto our fathers by the prophets. But he continues on and says, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he created the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. It's... Hebrews 1 is not talking about uh, a second person in the Godhead. He's saying in the Old Testament, the work came to the prophets. And the New Testament writer, Peter, he describes it like this. He says, we know that no prophecy of the Scripture is, any pri is of any private interpretation. Because holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. He's talking about these writers of Scripture. He's specifically talking about the Old Testament, but we extend that to the canon in the New Testament. And this is what the writer of Hebrews is saying. God, in many different ways and in many different times, sundry times and diverse manners, spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. He gave them prophets. He sent to them prophets with a message to declare to them. But what he's really saying is that in the New Testament... There are no more prophets, but we have an even clearer word. Because he hath spoken unto us by his Son. And verse 3 of that prologue, that opening, makes it very clear. The Son is not a separate person. He's not a separate God. But he is the full expression. He is the human expression of God himself, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person. This is what God looks like in our universe and in our world. If God were to fully express himself, he would look like Jesus. That shouldn't surprise us too much because the first man, Adam, was made in the image of God. And so when Jesus comes, the full expression of the divinity of God in flesh in our world, well, he also is fully the image of God. And not just the image of God, he is the express image of God. He's the fullness of the Godhead bodily in this man, Christ Jesus. And so Jesus is saying to these believers, if we could look at our judges in the Old Testament and in our past, those corrupt judges, if we could look to them and we could accept them, as authorities, why does it stretch you so much to think that 
I would be what I say that I am. It's just a natural extension of that. It is that rather than receiving the word, I am the word that has come to you. And I and my Father are one. So, verse 36, why do you think it blasphemy? And then verses 37 and verse 38, he uses the argument of his works. If you can't believe what I say, at least believe what I do. It's not just that I'm talking the talk, but I'm walking the walk. I'm, I'm doing what God would do if he were here. Because in fact, I do what the Father tells me to do. And I do nothing except what the Father tells me to do. And I do everything that the Father tells me to do. In other words, every action that I take is identical with the will of God. Why? Because I am God manifest in the flesh. And his little scriptural foray didn't really satisfy them, so they sought again to take him, but he escaped out of their hand. He went away again beyond Jordan into the place where John at first baptized, and there he abode. And many resorted unto him and said, John did no miracle, but all things that John spake of this man were true. So it appears that there is kind of this closing of the loop with John's disciples. They knew they were close enough to John. They knew he did not do miracles, but they had also heard him speak of Jesus. And they noted that everything that John said about Jesus had come true. And so verse 41 says, many believed on him there. So this wraps up the, the last interaction here with these Jewish leaders. And as we go into to chapter 11 in coming weeks, you'll see the story turns and we are uh, again on a fast track headed toward the crucifixion. But before we go there, I, I want to back up and I want to grab one phrase out of verse 35. In the midst of Jesus' argument, he just drops this phrase in there. And, you know, it's always amazing the way that Scripture, um, it, it seems like these little jewels just sit there, you know. And every once in a while as you're reading or you're studying or you're thinking and meditating and praying, one of these things will jump off the page at you. Notice what Jesus said in verse 35. If he called them gods, unto whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken. This was a key link in his argument. So the word of God came to them, and they were called gods, but the word cannot be broken. First of all, notice the fact that there is no distinction between the Word of God and the Scripture. Those terms are used interchangeably here. And those men were called judges. They were called gods because they received the Word of God. And Jesus just stipulates the Word of God, the Scripture, cannot be broken. And you'll notice there was no argument. He did not attempt to prove that. And he did not expect any resistance on that because... They accepted that. That was part of their understood theology and their understanding of Scripture, was that the Scripture cannot be broken. Now, the word there that is used for broken is, um, if you study Greek, one of the first Greek verbs you will ever learn is luo, and I tried to study and I didn't get very far, and I don't have very much understanding, but I do remember luo. And the reason that luo is chosen is because it is a verb that is easily conjugated, and it becomes the pattern for conjugation of other verbs, and then you have to learn all of the exceptions, of course. Present tense, past tense, past perfect, so on and so forth. So this is a verb that every Greek student likely knows, and really what it means is loosed or um, dissolved or done away. And Jesus is using it here in the sense that we would say you can't break the law. You can't violate the law. 
He's saying that Scripture cannot be broken, or it cannot be loosed, or it cannot be pulled out of place. Jesus is making the case that, look, in the Old Testament, it says, ye are gods, and you can't just yank that and throw it out. The Scripture cannot be broken. It cannot be taken away. It cannot be thrown away. And this is a key part of his argument because it links the Old Testament practice to what he's saying here in the New Testament. But when I read that, I thought, what a great word for us today. Just a great reminder. And I know that most of us, intellectually, we would accept that and we would read that passage and say, of course, the Scripture cannot be broken. But let me remind you and maybe even encourage you this morning that the Scripture cannot be broken. And that there are great and precious promises that are in this book. And Jesus was making the point that there are many prophecies and promises about him that cannot be broken. Not only the practice of calling the leaders Elohim, (laughs) not only is that an acceptable practice because the scripture cannot be broken, but remember Isaiah chapter 9 verse 6 we referred to last week, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That scripture cannot be broken. That was a promise of God to them. If you read Isaiah chapter 35, he talks about the wilderness shall shall bloom and blossom and the desert shall blossom as a rose and and, uh, all of these things. and, And your God will come. We referred to that last week. That scripture cannot be broken. But there are many others for us today, and we find ourselves in a situation where things that we once thought were strong and were great fortresses have been shaken. And the Scripture talks about the fact that in the last days, everything that can be shaken will be shaken. As believers, we have to be very careful not to confuse the things of this world with the things of the world to come. There are temporal things, there are temporary things, and there are eternal things. And Paul admonished us that we look not on the things which are seen, but on the things which are not seen. Because the things which are seen are temporal. They are bound up in time. They are temporary. But the things which are not seen, those are the eternal things. Those are the lasting things. Don't put your hope in things of this world. Don't put your hope in political things. Don't put your hope in economic success. Don't put your hope in uh, those kinds of things because those can be fleeting and they can be taken away at a moment's notice and without any notice at all. But it is the things of God that are lasting things. Isaiah said, the grass withereth and the flower fadeth, but the word of our God shall stand forever. The scripture cannot be broken. If you want to build your house, as Pastor talked about, if you want to build your house, you need to build it upon the rock. You need to build your house on the rock of the word of God because it will not be moved. It will not be loosed. It will not be luoed in any way if you can build your house upon the Word of God. And this brings us great comfort because we can find things in the Scripture that tell us even when the world around us passes away. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away, the Lord said. So even when every situation, everything around us seems to be Um, in trouble and at risk, know that the Scripture cannot be broken. And remember what Paul said when he wrote in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. He said, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. Remember, 1 Corinthians 15 is a discussion of the resurrection. And Paul saying 
There must be a resurrection. There is a resurrection. If there were no resurrection, then Christ is not risen and we are living in our sins even to this day. And this is the phrase and the context in which he, has, he says, if, if we had a hope in this life only, we would of all men be most miserable. I would remind you this morning that the scripture cannot be broken. And if your hope is in this life only, you are most miserable because what you will find is that there is nothing in this world that you can put your hope in that will last and will give you confidence going forward. But there is a resurrection that is to come. And Paul says, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. And we shall be changed. So whether we live or whether we die, we will be changed at the trumpet. The dead will be raised incorruptible. And we, as he says in another of his writings, which are alive and remain, we will be changed at that trumpet. The scripture cannot be broken. Don't be discouraged when you see everything falling away around you and the world crumbling at your feet, don't be discouraged because there's coming a day when we will all be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality. So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. What seems final to our flesh will be swallowed up in victory. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? The sting of sin is death, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. He has taken care of it. In verse 58, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says, Therefore... Because of all of this, because we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Because this mortal must put on immortality and this corruptible must put on incorruptible. Because of those things and, and because the scripture cannot be broken. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, be ye unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. I cannot promise you that you won't face sickness. I cannot promise you that you won't face death. I cannot promise you that you won't face economic ruin. I cannot promise you that you won't face persecution. I cannot promise anything for this world. But what I can say to you. Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. How could I encourage you to be so? Because the scripture cannot be broken. And you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Invest in the kingdom of God. It is the lasting kingdom. Make sure you are prepared for the return of the Lord. I don't know when it will come, but it seems as though we are rapidly approaching that day. And it seems to be accelerating. Just know this morning that when everything else is breaking, the scripture cannot be broken. And in 1 Thessalonians 4, when Paul talks about this, we which are alive and remain will be caught up to meet them in the clouds. So shall we be with the Lord. He says... Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. While I can't promise you anything in this world, I can give you encouragement this morning to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Let's go to prayer this morning and ask the Lord to let these words take real root in our hearts and let them be a source of strength to us. And renew our conviction, not only that Jesus Christ is who he said he was, but that he has prepared a place for us. And if he goes away, he's coming back again 
to take us there. And let the Lord steal the resolve of the scripture within our hearts and minds this morning. Lord, we're thankful for your word. Thankful for the opportunity we've had to spend time in your word. And I ask right now, Lord, that you would bury these words deep in our hearts this morning. That there would be a comfort and an assurance that the word cannot be broken that it cannot be loosed, that there is not one letter, there is not one punctuation mark that can be jarred loose from your word, but your promises are yea and amen. And though this world pass away with a fervent heat, yet there is to the believer a hope that goes beyond this life. And I pray, Lord, that you would enable us to be encouraged this morning in knowing that and in knowing that the Scripture is solid and cannot be broken and that we can build our hearts, our lives, we can build our families, we can build our church on that rock. And we ask, Lord, that you would establish these things in our hearts and in our minds in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask it. We give you thanks and glory, Jesus, in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless you. Look forward to meeting with you again next week, Lord willing. And in the meantime, avail yourself of worship opportunities online and allow the Spirit of the Lord to work in your heart and in your family. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Lord bless you.